Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles and I'm the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. Today we are going to talk about one of the least cheery topics imaginable, child sacrifice throughout the Old Testament history of the nation of Israel. Now if that sounds awful to you, just wait. It's worse than you might think. Today's study is both fascinating and horrifying, and it has implications for today that may surprise you. Let's begin in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This passage begins to introduce the reasons that someone might resort to sacrificing his own child. It's seen as potentially the ultimate expression of devotion. We can see in this passage an, an, a sense of escalation where the, the question has been asked, what kind of offering will be acceptable? What will be enough to atone for my transgressions? And the first suggestion is burnt offerings, calves a year old. And then beyond that, thousands of rams. So instead of just one burnt offering, it's a, a huge multitude of burnt offerings. And then beyond that, ten thousands of rivers of oil. And then finally, at the pinnacle, the, the most precious offering, shall I give my firstborn? A man by the name of Diodorus Siculus, who was a first century BC Sicilian historian who generally did a rather good job of documenting things and getting it right, wrote about Carthaginian child sacrifice at a time when the people of that city were losing a war badly and feared they might be destroyed. They also alleged that Cronus had turned against them, inasmuch as in former times they had been accustomed to sacrifice to this god the noblest of their sons. But more recently, secretly buying and nurturing children, they had sent these to the sacrifice. And when an investigation was made, some of those who had been sacrificed were discovered to have been suppositious. That's a very seldom used and old word meaning substitutes, or we might say they were body doubles. When they had given thought to these things and saw their enemy encamped before their walls, they were filled with superstitious dread, for they believed that they had neglected the honors of the gods that had been established by their fathers. In their zeal to make amends for their omission, they selected two hundred of the noblest children and sacrificed them publicly. And others who were under suspicion sacrificed themselves voluntarily in number not less than three hundred. There was in their city a bronze image of Cronus extending its hands, palms up, and sloping toward the ground, so that each of the children, when placed thereon, rolled down and fell into a sort of gaping pit filled with fire. So that's awful, but you might be asking, what does it have to do with Israel? Well, although Carthage was a city in North Africa located in what is today Tunisia, it was initially a colony established by the Punic peoples, also called the Phoenicians. Their two major homeland cities were Tyre and Sidon. In the Bible, these people would be called Canaanites. Now, that term, Canaanite, referred to a wide variety of Gentile nations, but the point is that this particular nation, the Phoenicians, had an ancient religious practice of burning their children alive as offerings to Baal, the king of their pantheon. When the Israelites entered the Promised Land and set up shop, God warned them three or four hundred times not to behave like the people around them, and especially not to pick up their pagan worship. They didn't heed this warning supremely well. So, we've got the Phoenicians offering their children to Baal, or Kronos, the Moabites offering their children to Chemosh, the Ammonites offering their children to Milcom, and all of these are typically wrapped together in the Old Testament under the name Molech. Archaeological finds confirm this practice of child sacrifice. What kind of archaeological finds, I hear you asking? Urns full of infant bones, along with sacrificial animal remains and very charcoal-rich soil. Inscriptions depicting priests holding infants on the way to the altar. Inscriptions on the urns, like 
to our Lady, to Tanit, the face of Baal, and to our Lord, to Baal Haman, that which was vowed by so-and-so, because he heard his voice and blessed him. In one of these sites at Carthage, the excavators figured roughly 20,000 small children had been burned and buried there. The ancient Israelites, directly contrary to God's instructions, engaged in child sacrifice to Molech, which is essentially just a renaming of Baal, and there are even hints that participants in this type of worship thought that their actions were service to the Lord, the God of Israel. Why would anyone do such a thing? I have four kids. In fact, by the time you're seeing this, I very well might have five. And it is nauseating for me to contemplate someone else treating any of my children this way, let alone doing this myself. But if we can clench our stomachs and try for a few minutes to empathize with some truly horrible people, we can come to a better understanding of how this made sense to them. Children are deeply important. We all know that in our bones. The preservation of life and of civilization is a goal most of us pursue naturally, even though it's not obviously beneficial from a utilitarian perspective. Sure, we'd like to have someone around who's beholden to us and feels some kind of obligation to take care of us when we're too old to see or drive or eat or walk. But just having kids is no guarantee of their help in those circumstances, and slaving away to take care of them in some ways is detrimental to our health and probably shortens our lives a little bit. Yet, almost all of us appreciate youth. We find little screaming potatoes to be cute beyond all logic, and not only do we agree that we bear responsibility for the kids that we have even by accident, but we actively pursue procreation even without realizing we have that goal in mind. Many of the pagan gods of the ancient world, and the not-so-ancient world come to think of it, are deeply associated with fertility. Often this has to do with crops, but just as often it has to do with bearing children. There's an analogy between the usually male sky god, think of Zeus, Jupiter, Thor, Uranus, or Baal, and the usually female earth goddess, respectively. That would be Hera, Juno, Sif, Gaia, or Asherah. The sky rains on the earth, and the earth sprouts new life out of itself. It's quite similar to the male and female roles in reproduction, and both types of fertility are essential to the continuation of life. However, childbirth is a very rough process for humans, much more so than for other mammals. Our heads are comically large at birth, made so in order to house the comparatively enormous brains God has given us. This makes birth very dangerous for both mother and babies, and the mortality rates of both were quite high up until the modern era. On top of that, the first few months of life are an incredibly risky period when an utterly incompetent little parasite is consumed with just learning how to eat. Meanwhile, mom is trying to figure out how to nurse and how to communicate on some level with this astoundingly self-centered little demon who doesn't want to sleep unless he's eating and might just die of hypothermia or asphyxiation if left alone for any length of time. Somehow, throughout all of this, mom has to get enough sleep to be somewhat functional and keep her milk supply up, or else the screaming little monster will starve to death. This is all assuming that mom has plenty of food herself. And how's that going to happen? When she spends half of her waking hours feeding and consoling the tiny beast, and the other half trying unsuccessfully to get some sleep. Dad had better be around to protect and provide, or there are going to be problems. And all of that assumes no interference from man or beast, which is a sketchy proposition at best. We don't have to deal with these age-old concerns to nearly the same degree anymore because of amazing advances in agriculture, medicine, and technology. That makes it harder for us to comprehend the ancient struggle. Let's say you know your baby is quite likely to die 
no matter how hard you tried to keep him alive. And someone comes up with a bright idea. Make the most intense appeal to God possible. Give up the most precious thing you possess to him. In hope that he will repay you sevenfold. More kids who will survive and plenty of rain and therefore plenty of crops for the whole family to eat. If you'll willingly go through that abject misery, the future will be better. That's the promise. It's wrong. It's evil. But it's not so far outside the realm of reason. God made it very clear from the beginning that child sacrifice is absolutely unacceptable. We've discussed Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac on this program before, and in that instance, while the critic might point out that God himself directed Abraham to sacrifice his son, there are two other factors we ought to consider. One, it was in imitation of the Canaanites' practices that Abraham saw around him, and two, God forbade it in the end. You can find this in Genesis chapter 22. When he was in the process of rescuing Israel from slavery in Egypt, God told them that the firstborn of man and animal were consecrated to him. But he required that children be redeemed, substituting a different sacrifice in their place, since they would be unacceptable as offerings to him. Which sounds a bit clinical, but he wanted them to see it as something that just didn't please him. And you can read about that in Exodus 13. Then we get into the actual law of Moses. I'm going to skip a bunch of instances where God makes this very point and just focus on a few. First of all, Leviticus chapter 20. Let's read the first five verses. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people, because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan and will cut them off from among their people, him and all who follow him in whoring after Molech. God considers that it profanes his sanctuary and his name. These would be two of those hints I mentioned, that Molech worshippers at least sometimes dedicated their horrible offerings to the God of Israel. He's telling them here, I don't want that sort of offering. In fact, I want it so little that I want you to execute any parent who's so brutally despicable as to murder his own child in my name, or even not in my name. And if you won't do it, then I will. And I'll even hold their families and communities responsible for not doing anything about it. Deuteronomy chapter 12, beginning in verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. This practice is here being associated with those Canaanite nations I mentioned previously, and it's being listed as the worst of the morally despicable behaviors that they considered to be normal, for which God was punishing these nations in the first place by bringing in the Israelites to supplant them. Again, he makes it clear, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Yet, Israelites offered up their children to Molech. 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David has done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Okay, well, Ahaz wasn't a particularly good guy in the first place. Maybe it was just a case of a tyrannical and morally bankrupt ruler oppressing a basically righteous nation. It wouldn't be the first time, right? In 2 Kings 17, in the middle of an explanation for why the ten northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel, 
were deported to other parts of the Assyrian Empire after being defeated, we read in verse 17, And they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings, and used divination and omens, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Another king of Judah, Manasseh, did the same thing. And you can read about that briefly in 2 Kings 21. It was still happening early in Josiah's reign until he stepped up and took care of the problem as best he could. But as most evils do, it came back just a generation later. And while Zedekiah was king, it was apparently a widespread practice. The biblical histories don't record this, but in Ezekiel 20 and 23, God lists it as an ongoing sin. Let's read God's feelings about it in Ezekiel 16, verses 20 and 21. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them, to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter, that you slaughtered my children, and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? He's not just saying, you broke the rules, or I told you many times, that's a no-no. He tells Israel, you slaughtered my children over a stupid, worthless idol. He's not just irritated about this. He takes it personally. Those are his kids, and he loves them. And their parents are murdering them. The practice didn't end until the southern kingdom went into captivity. There were two primary locations where this type of idolatrous cultic worship occurred. One was called Topheth, and the other was called Olivet. Let's start with the first one. The word Topheth, while it mostly refers to the location, actually means something like fireplace. The original name of this place was the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. This valley stretched around the southwest corner of Jerusalem, so it was terribly convenient for the king to use it as a site for religiously ordained infanticide. In 2 Kings chapter 23, Josiah cleaned up this site, or defiled it, depending on your perspective. There's a list of references to Topheth in the book of Jeremiah, including chapters 7, 19, and 32. These all indicate that the practice of child sacrifice was still going on as Jerusalem neared its downfall at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian armies. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you, and shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So will I break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth, because there will be no place else to bury. Thus will I do to this place, declares the Lord, and to its inhabitants, making this city like Topheth. The houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah, all the houses on whose roofs offerings have been offered to all the host of heaven and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods, shall be defiled like the place of Topheth. He's had enough. He's given them chance after chance, and they keep going back to their sins, including the killing of their own children. And he says that although the people by and large considered Topheth to be a sacred site and not open to use as a graveyard, they would run out of other options, and the place would be defiled beyond recovery, like a clay pot dashed into pieces, hence the symbolic act of breaking the flask, as God told Jeremiah to do in verse 10. So, what became of Topheth? They stopped using it for child sacrifice, for one thing. But through a series of leaps, it became the symbolic pattern for another place that you're familiar with. I said before, Topheth means something like fireplace. It's not really the proper name of the place. That name was the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, as I mentioned. In Hebrew, that is Ge Ben Hinnom. Say that enough times, and you will cut out the unnecessary son of and just start calling it Gehenna. Carry that over into Greek, and it becomes Gehenna. And where that word occurs in the New Testament, we have the English word hell. The place of child sacrifice, figuratively speaking, is hell. What about the other place that was used for this awful practice? Olivet or the Mount of Olives. We didn't mention this before, but King Solomon the Wise was actually the one to introduce and legitimize Molech worship near Jerusalem. 
For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. That mountain is later called the Mount of Olives, or Olivet. When Josiah defiled Topheth, he also defiled Olivet. There, in 2 Kings 23.13, it's called the Mount of Corruption because of what was going on there. It's possible that child sacrifice re-emerged there on the mountain after Josiah defiled it, as it did in the valley to its south and southwest, but if that's the case, it's never mentioned in the text. So, what became of Olivet in the end? Well, we find it popping up in Zechariah chapter 14. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. This is a picture of restoration. God portrays this mountain, Olivet, as providing a refuge for his people. Eventually, Jesus ascended back to his home in heaven from... You guessed it, the Mount of Olives. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So, in both cases, with Topheth and Olivet, the evil practice ceased. Topheth became the site for other unclean practices like burial and perhaps a garbage and sewage dump, although the evidence for those latter two is pretty sparse. In the end, unquestionably, its name became synonymous with hell. Olivet regained a good reputation and became a refuge for Jesus and even the site of his ascension into heaven. That's a much better ending, isn't it? Well, in any case, thank God child sacrifice isn't a problem for us, right? Wrong. We just have to look a little harder in order to see it. The most obvious example is abortion. An enormous contingent of the population looks at abortion no differently from the way many ancient peoples looked at child sacrifice or simple exposure to get rid of unwanted children. They felt a little bad about it, sure. But they reasoned that it would be better for everyone if that child died now. Whether that meant tossing unwanted Hebrew baby boys in the Nile, or leaving deformed babies on a hillside to die of exposure or be eaten by the wildlife, or abandoning unwanted baby girls in China because of the one-child policy, or making a cold and sterile decision to kill a child in the womb. It's always a selfish act of evil, dressed up as a noble deed. I've read a lot of arguments from academics that contend the child sacrifice we're discussing today never really happened because it's just so awful. Surely no one would ever actually do that. Those arguments never hold up. There's just too much evidence that it really did happen. And yet, it's often a foregone conclusion in these people's minds that it couldn't have. And people may resort to very creative interpretation to explain away the absolutely unthinkable infanticide. Meanwhile, the local abortion clinic, the same process for all intents and purposes, goes on day after day punishing innocent babies for the sins of their parents and painting it as either morally neutral or positively righteous. Child sacrifice also happens in less gruesome ways. How much of our response to this pandemic has been at the expense of our children? Governments are writing checks and taking out loans in the name of the next generation, who, for some reason, aren't afforded any representation or voice in the matter. An entire budding generation 
was deprived of a year of education in the name of preserving the lives of their grandparents and great-grandparents. No one wants the old folks to die. But even though we've learned how minuscule is the epidemiological threat from opening the schools, at least with this particular virus, in many major cities they have remained closed, usually at the behest of teachers' unions holding the kids' education hostage as a bargaining chip. Is that completely different from the evil of child sacrifice we've examined today? It's softer, no doubt. But in terms of actual life years lost, considering today's far larger population, I suspect we're either even or have overtaken those ancient barbarians. So, what do we get from this study? First, it's evil to make your children pay for your mistakes or for your greed. Second, it's still happening today, and none of us should turn a blind eye to the issue. God is not happy with those who stand idle when they should be doing good deeds. Third, you today are not a different species from the ancient Carthaginian or Canaanite or Israelite baby killer. That in and of itself doesn't make you guilty of the same thing, of course, but we as a society certainly aren't morally superior. We call evil good and good evil just as they did. We need a savior just as they did. I've known women who've had abortions. I've known men who've effectively performed abortions. As awful as that is, it's not an unforgivable offense. It's usually very difficult for those who have participated in the process to forgive themselves, but God is willing to forgive if we repent and confess and ask forgiveness through his son Jesus. The way Topheth and Olivet ended up is a good analogy for this. The Valley of Hinnom was used for all sorts of horrible abominations, and although they were eventually put to a stop, the place was never redeemed. Its end was, figuratively speaking, hell. That will be our end, too, if we don't accept the cleansing and revival that Jesus offers. The Mount of Olives was also used for an exceptionally awful practice, but it was redeemed and put to good, honorable use later. Let God have control. Put off sin and desecrate those parts of your life so you'll never even want to return to them. Then, let Jesus live in you by keeping his commandments and putting your trust in him for salvation and eternal life. If you'd like to learn more about how to do that, get in touch with us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org, and we'd love to help. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.